So it's a, a pleasure to be here and to uh, tell you a little bit about um, the physics of cell sensing. Um, this is a field that I study. Um, I, I study the ways that cells can communicate to improve their ability to cell sense the environment. Um, but I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of a historical approach to this question of how, how sensitive cells can be in detecting uh, chemicals in their environment. Uh, because the question does have a nice history. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of move uh, from about results that were sort of pioneering about 40 years ago to some of the more modern investigations uh, looking at how cells can sense their environment collectively, together. Um, so, the, so first of all, cells are very sensitive, so what does that mean? So a couple of examples are um, immune cells, for example, can detect and respond to a single molecule, right? So it's been shown that a single molecule can interact with an immune cell and it will mount an entire immune response. Uh, Receptor cells inside of some insects' noses can also smell a single molecule. Um, amoeba, which are a, a very well-studied organism for single-celled organism for sensing spatial changes in chemical <coughs> concentrations, can detect a difference of about 10 molecules on one side of their body, uh, between one side of their body and the other side of their body. So we're talking about you know, almost single molecule resolution for sensing. Um, and this is amazing. It may not be surprising um, because sensing the chemicals in your environment is very important if you are a cell. And um, cells are also usually pretty old. So they've had many, many, many years to evolve uh, clever biological ways to, to sense their environment. And so the, the question that's really going to drive what I'm going to talk about today is, are cells in some sense done evolving? Have they reached the limit of detectability? C have they reached the limit of how sensitive they can be? And if so, what, what is that limit? What sets that limit? And you might think that in order to answer that question, you have to you know, choose your favorite cell and really understand in great biological detail how its receptors work, how those receptors are paired to a particular molecule, what then happens at the membrane and how that triggers a response downstream inside the cell, etc. But that is actually not the, pr the approach I'm going to take, um, mostly because I'm a physicist, but also because I want to tell you about work from other biological physicists who argued that, in fact, if cells are really approaching the ultimate limit of what is possible to sense, then they're no longer limited by their own biology, they're limited by the physics of the sensing process itself. So that argument was first really fleshed out um, by two physicists in 1977. So they launched into a study of physical limits to cell sensing. And by the way, since this is going to be on the board, it's going to be, you know, a nice slow pace. And I, I encourage you to interrupt me if you want to ask any questions, if anything's unclear. That's, that's very natural. Um, so these two physicists were Howard Berg and Edward Purcell. Howard Berg is uh, one of the most well-known uh, investigators of uh, bacteria still is, and um, he was investigating bacteria at the time as well, and uh, Edward Purcell has passed away, but he, he was a famous physicist, a Nobel Prize winner, who spent most of his life not thinking about biological problems, but toward the end of his career, he um, started thinking about sensing by bacteria with Howard Berg. And so they began to think of the problem just in a very simple way. So they imagined that you have a cell, Okay, this is sort of a physicist drawing of a cell. It doesn't really matter what its shape is or how it works. It's just we're going to make sure we know how big it is. So I'm going to say this is a cell with some sort of length scale, which I'll call A. And the job of this cell, the task that 
Berg and Purcell considered was how precisely the cell could sense a uniform concentration of some chemical in its environment. So I've sort of drawn the molecules of this, of this chemical, and let's say it has a uniform concentration C0. So Berg and Purcell reasoned that no matter how the cell is actually sensing this molecule, what, it's, what it amounts to, you know, an approximation to the sensory process, is they imagined the cell is just doing something equivalent to counting the number of chemical, you know, a number of molecules within its own volume. So that number, if the cell were to make a count, would be, would scale like the background concentration times the cube of the length scale, right? If it were an actual sphere, it'd be four-thirds pi r cubed, four-thirds pi a cubed. If it were a cube, it'd be a cubed, okay. But I, I'm, I'm not gonna worry too much about, you know, the, the factors yet because this is just a simple argument to start. Um, so, this would be what the cell would count on average, but what's happening in this environment, as was discussed by Tony Hyman earlier, is that everything is sort of diffusing, right? If we sort of think of this as a soluble chemical, then everything is diffusing. Which means that the concentration uh, is sort of fluctuating, right? The number of molecules inside the cell volume may not always be exactly this, but it would be this on average, okay? Um, but the fluctuations are important if we want to know how precisely the cell is making this measurement. So because molecules are diffusing, it won't always detect this exact amount. There will be fluctuations in this. Um, and those fluctuations are what Tony referred to as intrinsic noise, right? So intrinsic noise has a, has a Poisson distribution, which means that the... the variance in this number equals the mean. So that means that, so is everybody familiar with terms like variance and standard deviation and mean? Okay, I see some nods. So that means that the, the variance in this measurement will also be equal to the same thing as the mean. Um, now, this starts to get an idea of what we want, which is sort of the, uh, the precision or the, the error, you could say, that the cell makes in this measurement. Because we can take the square root of this, the standard deviation, and divide it by the mean. And that gives sort of a, a, a relative uncertainty, a, a, a relative amount of fluctuations that the cell will experience when trying to count these molecules. So I'm going to call this an error, epsilon. And so this is just nothing more than 1 over the square root of the mean, because the variance equals the mean. And so this would go like 1 over the square root of c naught times a cubed. So this already says that if the cell is bigger, it has a smaller error, because it's counting more molecules. If the concentration is richer, denser, if there are more molecules to count, then it also has a smaller error. So these things make sense. I hope. Um, then there was a second insight by Berg and Purcell, and that is that the cell doesn't just have to make one measurement if it's willing to wait some amount of time. So if, it, if it's willing to wait some amount of time, it can take multiple measurements. And why is that useful? It's because in the meantime, between measurements, molecules will have diffused. And actually, it will be counting different molecules than it counted in its previous measurement. So that amounts to a second measurement that is independent from the first. And that should, in principle, reduce the error. It's like taking multiple measurements in an experiment that you're doing, if they're independent. So what's the criterion for the second measurement to be independent from the first? How long does the cell need to wait? Well, the answer is it needs to wait sufficiently long for any one of these molecules that was inside of the cell to diffuse out. And that time scale will depend on the diffusion coefficient. And it will also actually depend on how big the cell is, right? So 
if we want something with the units of time, then we have and, and we think that it will depend on the diffusion coefficient and the size, how big the cell is, then we should recall what the, the units of these things are, right? The units of radius is just meters, right? Units of diffusion, does anyone remember? Meters squared per second. So how do I get a, how do I get a time? I need to take this and flip it up top, right? So d needs to be on the bottom, and then I need to cancel the two meters squared so I can do that with twice the length scale squared. Okay. If the cell is bigger, it takes longer to diffuse out of it. If the diffusion coefficient is bigger, it takes shorter to diffuse out of it. So. This is the typical amount of time between measurements that would make those measurements independent. So if the cell waits for a time t, then the number of measurements it can make, the number of independent measurements it can make, would be t over this time scale tau, or t d over a squared. And what we expect is that the variance should be reduced by this number of independent measurements. So we would expect that the variance in sort of the time integrated process, which I'll denote sigma squared t, should be the variance in, in any one of these measurements divided by the number of independent measurements, right? So this then becomes C naught A cubed divided by this quantity, TD, and I need another A squared up top, right? So now the relative error in the cell's measurement, after it waits for a certain amount of time t, is this reduced standard deviation divided by the mean. So this is going to look like uh, the square root of c naught a to the fifth over dt divided by C naught A cubed, right? So there will be a square root of C naught left in the denominator. This, there will be a uh, let's see. This will be like an A to the sixth under the radical. So there will also be a square root of A under the no denominator. So this will look like one over the square root of C naught A D and T. So what does this mean? This means that, as before, if the cell is bigger, it reduces its error. If the concentration is higher, it reduces its error. But now also, if the molecules are diffusing faster, then the error is also reduced because the cell can take more measurements in a given amount of time. Or if simply the time that the cell is willing to wait is longer, then that also reduces the error. And this relationship uh, involving two properties of the cell, the size and the amount of time it's willing to wait, and two properties of the environment, the concentration and the diffusion of the molecules, this is, I guess, well known enough to now you know, be known as the Berg Purcell limit. So this is uh, what Berg and Purcell argued first would set the limit to, to uh, how sensitive a cell could be. And notice that it, you know, we've made some terrible assumptions here, that molecules go right through the cell and that you know, we haven't, don't even have receptors and things like this. But we can, what I want to do is sort of gradually bring in some of these features that make the model more realistic. And what we'll always see is that this scaling always holds. Though there might be you know, some prefactor, some 
order two, three prefactor in front. And maybe there'll be additional terms corresponding to additional sources of noise for the biological process of interest. But this is sort of unavoidable. This, this sort of dependence for the sensory precision is, is always going to be there. OK. Sounds good? Questions so far? OK. All right, so let me start by um, ignoring uh, or, or correcting this uh, very odd assumption that cells can actually go through the membrane. And let me actually uh, consider the cell a, an attractor of cells, something that absor an, an attractor of molecules, something that actually absorbs molecules at its surface. Okay? So you can think of this as the cell maybe having receptors and these receptors keeping the molecules that they detect, right? internalizing, uh, bound receptors getting internalized, for example. Um, so this was actually the first more realistic model that was considered by Berg and Purcell, and they called this the perfect sink. So they still idealized the cell as a sphere. I hope that's okay with everybody. They gave that sphere radius A, and then they imagined that all the all the molecules that came into contact with that sphere through diffusion actually got absorbed. Okay, so there's perfect absorption of molecules at the at the surface of this sphere. So what does that mean? Well, it, first of all, it changes the, the, the fact that the concentration is uniform because molecules are now being affected by the cell. But nonetheless, if we go far enough away from the cell, we expect still there to be a relatively constant concentration. So we can still call the concentration infinitely far away from the cell C0. Um, and then if the cell is truly a perfect absorber, it means that the concentration at the surface of the cell will be zero, because there will be no molecules actually left. The cell will have eaten them, so to speak. So we expect some concentration profile. If this is a function of you know, the radial distance from the cell, and this is where the, the boundary is at A, we expect the concentration profile to be zero here and to be sort of constant at C naught out here. And there'll be some sort of interpolation in between. Right. So how do we find out what this functional form is? Because that's going to actually be useful for us to derive uh, how sensitive the cell can be if it's acting like this process. Well, um, to do that, we can solve the diffusion equation. Because the diffusion equation is what's going to govern the dynamics of this molecular concentration. Has anyone seen the diffusion equation before? I just want to get, OK, good, good, good. So the diffusion equation reads, the time derivative of the concentration is the diffusion coefficient times uh, del squared of the concentration itself. The second spatial derivative in three dimensions. And uh, this operator has many different forms depending on what coordinate system you want to use. It, you know, in Cartesian, it's just d squared x plus d squared y plus d squared z. I'm going to use spherical coordinates, unsurprisingly, because this is a sphere. And what's nice is because it's totally spherically symmetric, I should expect there to be no dependence on theta or phi, the two angles, only a dependence on r, as I've drawn it here. Right? So in spherical coordinates, this uh, second derivative operator, the radial part reads d over, or 1 over r squared, and then I have my d, times the derivative with respect to r of the product of r squared times the derivative with respect to r of the quantity c. And then, of course, there's parts that depend on theta and depend on phi. But as we know from symmetry, those, there, there can be no angular dependence of the, of the solution. OK, 
And what I'm interested in here is the concentration profile at steady state. Right? So I'm imagining this cell is in such a large environment that it's continually absorbing molecules at its surface, but it, it's, in, it's in such a large environment that that's not really perturbing the total concentration very far away. So it's in a huge bath. And so even in the infinite time limit, there's some persistent steady state profile uh, for the concentration. So steady state means that the time derivative here I can set to zero. OK, so we can already then say that if 0 is supposed to equal this side, that you know, I can sort of ignore this. right? And I have to have the derivative of something be 0. And if the derivative of something is 0, that something needs to be a constant. I don't know what that constant is yet, so I'll just call it a. So we have to have that r squared derivative with respect to r of c equals some constant a, right? Or bc dr equals a over r squared. OK. So this is something we can solve, right? The derivative of 1 over r squared is just minus 1 over r. So we can, we can integrate this. And if I integrate it, I also get another constant of integration, right? So this means that c of r is some constant of integration, which I can call b, minus a over r squared. Over r. Over r, thank you. Good. <laughs> um, so what are a and b? How do I find a and b? Well, I use the boundary conditions. I know that c of 0 is 0. C of a is 0. And I know that c of infinity is c naught. So, uh, so plugging those in, right? then the only solutions for a and b that I get are that c of r must be c naught times 1 minus a over r. And we can double check if r is a. This is 1 minus 1, I get 0. If r is infinity, this term goes away, and I get c naught. Right? OK. So why is this useful? So it seems like I started with the question of what's the precision of cell sensing. And, and right now, what I've done is I've derived what the concentration profile looks like. How are those related? So anytime you have uh, an absorption process, the way that the amount of stuff coming in is related to the profile of the stuff on the outside is through this slope. If this slope is steeper, it means you're getting molecules pouring into the cell at a higher rate. And in particular, this slope tells you about the flux of molecules into the surface, into the surface of the cell. So the flux, which is molecules per area per time, specifically, is given by the diffusion coefficient times this slope, times dr, dc dr evaluated at this boundary, where you care about the flux going, going into the cell. So we can calculate this, right? If we take a derivative of this, we get back to uh, 1 over r squared, right? We get c naught a over r squared. So this is. evaluated at a, and we get d c naught over a. Yeah. Now, that's the per area flux. right? And so if we want to get the total number of molecules that are entering the cell <laughs> in any given unit of time, we just multiply this by the surface area of the cell. So 
the molecules per time, which is usually called J, J is often used for, for flux, is just this times the surface area of the cell, 4 pi A squared times D C naught over A, right? Or 4 pi A D C naught. And now, as before, we're going to assume that the cell waits for a total amount of time t to gather its measurements. Right? So the total number of molecules, which I'll call m, is just 4 pi a dc naught times t, the amount of time that it waits. Now, once again, just as in this case, that number is an average because the diffusion equation that we've written down, it doesn't take into account the fact that molecules are discrete entities and they're moving around randomly. It's a field equation. It just takes into account what the smooth profile would be of these molecules if you had very many of them or if you only cared about their average and not the sort of particulate nature of the actual molecules. So this is an average number of molecules that the cell receives in a total amount of time t, so I'll call it m bar. And just as before, if molecules are independent, then the statistics of this number are Poissonian. Because diffu diffusion is a Poisson process, which means that, once again, the variance of this number is equal to its average. So We can once again calculate this ratio of the standard deviation to the average to get a sense of the relative error in this process. And that's just the square root of the average over the average, or 1 over the square root of the average. And so we just get 1 over the square root of 4 pi A, D, C naught, T. Right? So let's compare that with this. So it's actually the same dependence, the same scaling. We still have the square root of A, D, C naught, T. But now, by being less sloppy, we've actually also accounted for some sort of numerical prefactor. Right? It's 1 over the square root of 4 pi. So I, I hope that that is a little more satisfying than treating the cell as uh, a completely permeable sphere. Now the cell is something that eats everything that comes into contact. But you can see that the, the scaling, the way that its precision depends on the properties of itself and the environment, is unchanged. We just got this 1 over root 4 pi for our, for our troubles. And you can imagine if you said, and, and Berg and Purcell did say this, well, OK, we know that not all parts of the surface of the cell are covered in receptors. Receptors just are very small molecules that are sort of like little, little patches on the cell. What if we were more careful and, um, and made a model with individual receptors instead of making the whole cell the same, the, you know, some absorbing surface? Well, guess what? You still get the same sort of scaling. You just get a different prefactor up front. And actually, they did better than this. I won't uh, go into this in detail in the lecture, but they they actually asked, um, you know, how, how much of the cell area would you need to cover with receptors to even get close to this, this full amount of flux that you get if the whole cell is absorbing. And um, the answer is that you only need to cover, I think, like a tenth of a percent of the area of the cell with receptors in order to get half of the flux that you would get if 100% of the area of the cell were a complete absorbing receptor. And that sounds like magic, but the, the uh, reasoning behind that is because these molecules are being detected on the basis of diffusion. And diffusion is a very you know, um, 
sort of self-repeating process. So if, the, if a molecule finds itself anywhere within the vicinity of the surface of this cell, even if it doesn't hit a receptor, and it probably won't, it will bind and re not bind, it'll bounce and rebounce and, and bounce around the surface many, 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 many times before actually finding itself far away from the cell. So it has many, many opportunities to hit a receptor. You don't have to have very many at all. OK. Um, so the, uh, the next model that Berg and Purcell considered, and this may uh, dismay the person who asked about uh, membrane permeability, was actually, instead of a perfectly uh, absorbing sphere, was an actual perfectly permeable sphere. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, OK, well, let's be more careful, um, but let's stick to this model of uh, a, a perfectly permeable sphere. So let's once again assume that molecules are just diffusing around. and. Uh, the cell has some, is permeable to these molecules, and it has some magical way of counting the number of molecules in its volume. Now, this, this does seem a little bit weird, but I, I, I would argue it's actually a little bit more realistic to the case of a cell that has receptors that bind the molecules transiently and then release them, which is sort of, I guess, the more typical way you would think about receptors. So this would be the case more like where cells, you know, eat the molecules or somehow internalize them or consume them or something, this would be the case where they're just trying to monitor them. They're trying to detect them by binding, and then they release them back into the environment. Because if they do that, then they're not making a huge perturbation on the otherwise uniform concentration of the molecules in their vicinity. Um, so we can ask, well, what is then the error in this case? We should expect the same sort of scaling, but what kind of you know, prefactor do we get? And the problem here is that we can't necessarily use the same strategy, because the strategy here was to calculate the solution to the diffusion equation and then use the slope here to get a sense of how many molecules are being counted. Here, the solution to the diffusion equation is just C you know, as a function of space and time, is just C naught, right? So there's no flux, there's no absorption, there's no, we can't rely on this solution to actually get uh, the statistics of the number of molecules counted. So how did they deal with that? They, uh, they s well, they used a method which was to use the autocorrelation function of the, um, the autocorrelation time in the uh, diffusion statistics of these molecules inside of this volume. That's not what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to use a method that will be a little bit easier to extend to the multicellular problems that I'll talk about at the end of the, of the lecture. And that is to um, respect the particulate nature of molecules by adding to the diffusion equation a fluctuation term that corresponds to the sort of noise uh, in, in, in the diffusion of the molecules themselves. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm confused. I don't understand. What's the difference between this model and the first one? There is no difference. It's just in the, f in the first one, I was uh, very, uh, what, what I would say is I was waving my hands a lot. So I was just interested in deriving a scaling mm -hmm. instead of calculating an answer. Now I would like to calculate an answer. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so the solution to this diffusion equation is just a constant, because the cell imposes no boundaries on, on the molecular diffusion. So what I can do is actually add a fluctuation term to the diffusion equation. So the way you should think about this is, you know, as a function of some spatial coordinate, I can only draw in one dimension, but as a function of some spatial coordinate, on average, you could say, the concentration is uniform. But on top of that, because molecules might be closer together at some instances or farther apart in some instances, there would be fluctuations. 
on top of that spatial profile. And that's the function, that's going to be the function of this fluctuation term. This is a spatial version of what's often called a Langevin equation. Is that a, a term that's familiar to, to some of you? Okay, good. So Langevin equation is like an ordinary differential equation, but with some noise tacked on, and we'll have to be careful later, I won't get into it now, on what the statistics of that noise are. But usually they're, you know, it's just Gaussian white noise, for example. Okay, so what, what this looks like in mathematical terms is that now I have my concentration profile is otherwise constant, but it has some fluctuations on top of it, which I'm going to call delta C. So it's a uniform background on average plus some function delta C of space and time. Okay. And, of course, the, the goal for this process is, once again, to understand the fluctuations not in C itself, per se, but in the number of molecules captured by this volume. Right? So that number is just the integral over the volume of the cell of C of x and t in three-dimensional space. And in fact, knowing as we do before that the cell can actually wait a certain amount of time and improve the precision, what we're really interested in is the average of this, this number over a certain amount of time, big T. Okay. So this is the quantity whose mean and variance we want to calculate, and then we'll just take the ratio and see what we get. Is the, the goal clear? OK. So the mean of this average is straightforward, because the mean of the time average is just the same as the mean of any single measurement. And that's just the volume of the cell times the background average uniform concentration. So the mean is just 4 thirds pi a cubed times c naught. Yeah? OK. The variance in this time average I'm going to get by taking the Fourier transform of this equation. That's, that's a very common thing to do when you have uh, a fluctuating differential equation, especially, well, really only if it's linear, and this is linear. There's no like c squared or anything in here. So I can take the Fourier transform. And what the Fourier transform will give me is something called a power spectrum. And I'm going to claim, not prove, um, although I do have notes that Matthew has, uh, has uh, assured me will be available somehow through this course. And, and so there's extra details in there in case you get really curious. Um, what the power spectrum will give you is, and its low frequency limit, it will give you the variance of this quantity, which is exactly what we want. So what is the power spectrum, and, and how do we calculate it? So the power spectrum is a function of frequency. And it's essentially the, the Fourier transform of the, of the autocorrelation function, which I mentioned. And it's just the integral over frequency space of the average of fluctuations in this quantity. So we have, in Fourier space, fluctuations in n, right? Because C is fluctuating with delta C, then N will also fluctuate with delta N. And so I have the Fourier transform of delta N as a function of one of my frequency variables times delta N as a function of my other frequency variable. So I integrate over one of the frequencies, and I get the power spectrum as a function of frequency. OK, and sometimes people write the Fourier transform with, with tildes like this. OK. Now, what I was saying is that my claim is that the variance in this time average is just going to be related to 
uh, the power spectrum at its lowest frequency limit divided by the amount of time which I'm willing to wait. This is a result that's true as long as I'm willing to wait longer than this typical diffusion time, which I mentioned at the beginning of a squared over d. OK, so I'm going to skip uh, some of the details here, but just the outline is to take this variable, find its Fourier transform, plug it into here, and basically plow through these integrals. And that's the, that's the kind of details that I'm going to skip. Um, the one thing I will mention that is you know, sort of the remaining ingredients is, um, as you can see, the Fourier transform of delta n will depend on the Fourier transform of delta c. And so we need to somehow know from this diffusion equation uh, what it looks like in Fourier space. Right. So if I want to Fourier transform this, then the time derivative becomes, brings down essentially a minus i omega. And I can also plug this in. Right? If I plug this in, then the c naught is just vanishes when I take its time derivative or its spatial derivative. And I just get delta c's over here. So I Fourier transform this, and I get minus i omega delta c tilde equals. And now I have two spatial derivatives. And those don't bring down i omegas. Those bring down uh, minus i omegas. Those bring down minus i k, where k is the uh, spatial frequency or the wave vector. I have two of those, so it gets squared. And then I have a delta c. And then I have the Fourier transform of my noise variable. And so this is nice. Taking, taking this to Fourier space allows me to just algebraically solve for, for the Fourier transform of delta c. Right? Delta c as a function of wave vector and frequency is then just, so I square this, I get a k uh, minus k squared. right? Minus goes away, but then I get an i squared, which is minus 1, and then a k squared. So I can uh, bring that over to this side, and I get just eta tilde over k squared. And I missed my diffusion coefficient, didn't I? That should have been there. And that should be there. So I get a dk squared minus an i omega on the bottom. OK, so this says that the, the launch of on noise is driving the fluctuations in C. And the fluctuations in C will be integrated to give my fluctuations in N. And they'll be plugged in here. And I'll get my result. And I'll take its low frequency limit. And I'll get the variance that I want. So the only ingredient that I'm missing now is what are the statistics of this Langevin term. And I'll write this in, in Fourier space, so it would be, because that's what we're eventually going to need when I plug it into this integral. I get that eta star eta, right? Eta, is, eta in Fourier space is a function of k and omega. So I get sort of the cross spectrum of eta here is proportional to a couple things. There's a factor of 2, which I won't go into. But it should, the noise, the amount of noise should increase with the diffusion, the diffusion coefficient in the process. If the, if the molecules are diffusing more, then you should have sort of more, uh, you know, sort of a higher spectrum of fluctuations. It should also increase with the, the background concentration itself. So there's a C naught here. And then other than that, it should be just Gaussian white noise uh, in space and time. And so in real space, those would be sort of like delta correlated in time and delta correlated in space. So if I tra Fourier transform that, I turn those into uh, delta functions in frequency and delta functions in wave vector. Now, because of you know, I need to keep track of like where my two pi's are in my Fourier transform. I can put them in, in the frequency space here. So I get a two pi here, 
and a 2 pi cubed here, because this is a three-dimensional spatial variable. And there's one exception to this, to this idea that the noise should be delta correlated in space and time. And that is, I'm, I'm fine making the assumption that it's delta correlated in time. That's what you usually do if you have like, you know, a, a set of biochemical reactions or something. And you want to put Langevin noise, you, you just make sure that each reaction is sort of temporarily independent from the next. Um, but the diffusion is a spatial process. And what that means, I mean, if I sort of think of this as a grid, and these molecules are diffusing, if this molecule hops in space, then this grid site will gain a molecule, where, while this grid site will lose a molecule. So there's sort of spatial correlations, actually anti-correlations in space. And so the, the proper uh, statistics for this noise term are actually not completely delta correlated in space. There is a spatial frequency dependence. And the way that shows up in Fourier space is with a k squared dependence on the wave vector for this noise term. OK, so like I said, I'm not going to go through the details, but this should be the sufficient number of ingredients to actually plug into this integral. And if you take its low frequency limit, then what you get at the end of the day with all of these is you get that you get a 16 pi C naught A to the fifth over 15 D. Okay? So, oh, and I forgot my T. So I'm dividing by T. So the T comes in explicitly, the diffusion coefficients in here, the C naught came in here. The A, by the way, comes in because I'm integrating over the volume of the cell. So it comes into this, these spatial integrals. And the fact that it's a sphere and the various integrals give me this, these strange factors of 16 and 15 and pi. Okay? That's just math. So then, if I have the mean and I have the variance, then I can once again calculate this ratio. And I get that. I'll do, I'll do epsilon squared. That's sometimes easier. So epsilon squared is sigma squared over the mean squared. And that is 16 pi c naught a to the fifth over 15 dt. And then I have my mean, which is 4 thirds pi a cubed c naught. But I have to square it. So I get a 16 pi squared, 9 on top, a to the sixth, and a c naught squared. And lo and behold, so one of the pi's cancels, uh, the 16 cancels. This 9 goes away and makes this, no, and this 9 becomes a 3, and this becomes a 5. Everything but the A on the bottom cancels, the C naught on the bottom cancels. And I have a 3 over 5 pi, 1 over A C naught D T. Right? So once again, I could take the square root and I get this. So we just can't get away from the scaling. OK, that's fine. We get a new number out front. And I want to ask you guys, which is bigger, <laughs> 1 over 4 pi or 3 over 5 pi? Three over five pi is bigger, right? Three fifths is bigger than one fourth. Why is so? That means that there's more error in a sense. There's more error for this permeable sphere than there was for the perfectly absorbing absorbing sphere. Why is a cell that does something like this more error prone than a cell that is perfectly absorbing? Any ideas? The number is more. Yeah, 
Uh, that's the argument, who, who just said that? Yes, that's the argument that I've read. That um, the perfectly absorbing sphere never counts the same molecule twice, right? Every, every molecule it absorbs is a new molecule, which in some sense should be new information. The monitoring sphere has the possibility to count a molecule twice, because it might come in and then out and then come back in again. So that means that every molecule that this, that this sphere monitors might not be new. So it's getting some redundant measurements, and therefore um, it might have a higher error. The, the statement that actually this one absorbs more or, or, or counts more in a given amount of time, I haven't thought about that, actually. It's something that is probably easy to calculate, but I don't, I don't know. For a given t, yeah, how many does this count versus how many does that absorb? I don't know. That might be a, an, an alternative explanation. OK. So. Uh, yes, yes. In your, in your noise uh, uh, reflection, you, you added this case square to yes. for conserved noise. Yes. And I was wondering whether, you know, how would things change if you could, you would just create and, uh, and, and destroy your, your mind? Oh. Uh, you mean if they were not correlated in space they somehow? Are not conserved. So that oh, not conserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conserved. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because you can't destroy one here without also creating it somewhere else. Yeah, so there's conservation. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, um, my guess is that it would. It's a weird process to think about, but my guess is that it would um, decrease the noise because then. It, it basically, this, this conservation leads to the, the correlations between different regions of space, and then you, you add up many of these paths, and you get the phenomenon like this, where you end up counting the same molecule twice. And so I think by removing these anti-correlations, you would also remove the problem, the problem of counting the same molecule twice. That's my guess, that it would reduce the noise. OK. So that. I won't take you through any more arduous calculations. What I now want to ask, or rather present to you what Berg and Purcell asked by the end of this epic paper, um, is does any of this matter for actual data? Right? Do cells actually um, obey these limits, or is it even relevant? Are these limits even relevant? Can they even come close to these limits that are just sort of coming out of a, a physics thought process, in a sense. And so as I mentioned, Howard Berg was, uh, or you know, is and was an expert on bacteria. So one of the organisms that they compared these calculations to actual numbers in was E. coli bacteria. And the way they made their comparison uh, was the following. They said, Th they, they considered the way that bacteria actually respond to the chemicals that they detect in their environment. And some of you might know this, but E. coli in particular is a bacterium which has uh, a several appendages called flagella, which actually spin sort of like a corkscrew and allow it to move in a particular direction. And it doesn't just swim straight. It swims straight for a particular amount of time. And then at least one of the flagella switches directions, and that sort of causes a, 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 disorient or an, a reorientation of the bacterium, and it chooses a new direction in which to start swimming. And it repeats this process effectively undergoing a random walk. And these are called run phases, and this is called the tumble, where it, it reorients. So bacteria are doing this run and tumble. But at the same time, in principle, they're detecting concentration, uh, you know, a molecular concentration using receptors on their surface, et cetera. And if this is a molecule that the bacterium likes and the concentration is getting higher over here than it is over here, then the bacterium will bias its random walk to extend the runs that are in the direction of the concentration gradient. 
and shorten the runs that are in the direction against the concentration gradient. So it will no longer just do a diffusion run and tumble process, it will do a biased run and tumble process. Okay, so Berg and Purcell were interested in the precision with which a bacterium could answer this question during its run, is the concentration getting higher or is it getting lower? And so they imagined, you know, sort of zooming in on one of these runs, and let's imagine that it's in the direction of the concentration gradient. So we have a bacterium, let's say it's, it's just tumbled and it's going this way, and so toward the beginning of that run, it's here, and then it's running and running and running and running, and toward the end of that run, it's here, and you know, soon it's going to tumble into a new direction. Right? And let's say this run happens to be aligned with a concentration gradient, which I'll call G. So that means that it has the units of concentration per space. So it's just a linear increase of concentration as a function of spatial direction. OK, so let's say this run takes a total amount of time t. So this is sort of time equals 0, and this is time equals t. So <coughs> Berg and Purcell reasoned that in order for the bacterium to actually know what it's doing, the, the change in concentration that it detects over the course of its run, the difference in the concentration here minus here, has to be at least as big as the, the, the noise, the error in the, uh, the fluctuations in the concentration that the bacterium is experiencing because of this, these diffusive fluctuations. So that is to say, delta C has to be at least as big as the, the standard deviation in the concentration, in some sense. So we can use this criterion to derive a bound on the minimum time the cell needs to actually swim during this run. Because if it doesn't swim long enough, then it's only accumulated very poor statistics. And so the decision on whether to keep swimming or not is a very, a very ill-informed one. But if it swims for a very, very, very long time, it's gathering many, many measurements, and it's, it's getting better and better statistics that will tell it whether to keep swimming or not. Okay, that's the idea. Let's derive a bound on how long it should keep swimming. So uh, the change in concentration is just going to be the gradient times the amount of distance that it travels. And the amount of distance that it travels, if it's traveling at a velocity v, is just v times the total amount of time that it takes. So this, constant, this uh, delta c is just the gradient times v times t. Okay. <coughs> and for the variance, I'm just going to use the fact that uh, the typical variance over the mean should as we've seen in all of these examples, scale like 1 over a, c naught, d, and t. OK? So that means that uh, I can bring this over and say that sigma c squared is going to be like c naught squared over a, c naught, d, t, and cancel one of the c naughts. And then I take the square root, and I get that this quantity should be bigger than the square root of c naught over a dt. So I want to use this to derive a bound on my runtime t, like I said. Right? So I should square both sides, I think. So g squared v squared t squared has to be greater than c naught over a dt. I can make this a cube. If I cancel this out, I can divide this over. t cubed has to be greater than c naught over a d g squared v squared. Or the runtime has to be bigger than, so I'll call this sort of the minimum runtime, should be on the order of the cube root of this stuff, c naught over a d 
g squared v squared to the one third power. Okay, and what's nice is <coughs> at the time that Berg and Purcell were studying this, Howard Berg had all of these numbers for E. coli bacteria. And they were on, uh, on the following order. They, they took roughly the following values. So <coughs> in Howard Berg's experiments, he was noticing that basically the, the, at a background concentration on the order of one millimolar, the minimum gradient that E. coli could detect was about 10 nanomolar per millimeter. And we also need to know things like how big uh, an E. coli is, how fast they move. Does anyone know roughly how big an E. coli cell is? What are we talking? Yeah, two microns, a micron. I'm going to go with just orders of magnitude here. The length scale of E. coli is about a micron. How fast do E. coli swim? Ten microns, ten microns per second. That's right. It's something like 10, 20, that order. Uh, diffusion, the diffusion coefficient of the attractant that uh, they were studying, it's usually a very small molecule, and in water, very small molecules have diffusion coefficients on the order of hundreds of microns squared per second, or up to a thousand. So I'm just going to use a thousand microns squared per second. And that's everything. Right? So we can plug this, these in, and I'll spare you the details, uh, but it's useful to know, by the way, when converting from uh, a molar to 1 over a, a length cubed. Right? Molar is a concentration, so it should be 1 over a volume. So a nanomolar is about 1 molecule per micron, uh, per micron cubed. So you can sort of do that conversion, and what you get is that T min is about half a second. Okay, so this is a statement about statistics. It says that the bacterium on one of its runs should, should swim for at least half a second in order to gather enough statistics to be able to say whether it should keep swimming or whether it should tumble. Now, that has nothing to do with the actual amount of time that bacteria spend running. So now you can actually go to experiments and look, well, how long do bacteria actually spend in each of their runs? And the answer for the observed amount of runtime is about a second. Okay? So, you know, this, this can vary by, you know, you know, this is like order one second, two second, three second, whatever. And this, of course, we made some approximations. So the point is that these are basically on the same order. That's the best that I can say. Now, that has, there's two, two things to take away from that, right? First of all, bacteria are not running for a microsecond. They're not like beating this limit somehow. And that's good because this limit was supposed to be sort of like derived by physics it's the best that's physically possible. It, igno it ignores all manner of biology by which molecules are actually being detected by the bacteria, etc. So it's good that bacteria are not beating this limit. But the other thing is that bacteria are not taking an hour to run. So they're actually using run times which are pretty close to this limit. And that was uh, a conclusion that Berg and Purcell drew that basically whatever the sensory mechanism of bacteria, and we now know tons more than, than they did 40 years ago about how the receptors work, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever that mechanism was, it's operating pretty close to these ideal models of being like a perfectly absorbing sphere or a perfectly monitoring sphere. It's operating, bacteria are operating pretty close to the fundamental physical limit. 
So that uh, is the case for bacteria. And I'm just going to take the next 10 or 20 minutes or so to, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so even though it's doing a, a, a gradient measurement here, I'm being a little bit tricky and using what we've learned for sensing a uniform concentration. And one yeah. error in sensing, because the delta Cs are very small, one, I mean, which has its own fluctuation. One distance from time, I do the same argument of delta C and square root delta Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, so what I've done is I've used the uh, the, the result that we derive for a uniform, delta, uniform C, what I could have done and probably should have done is calculated the relative error in delta C, a measurement of the gradient itself. If you do that, you, um, you get something similar, is what I will say. Um, I think you get like a factor of a square root of 2 or something. Say again, you should get a, yeah. So if you, it, basically the point is that it, it has to be this way, it has to be this way based on dimensional analysis is, is the bottom line. And if you do something more careful than what I did, which you probably should do, then you get, um, you get diff, you know, f factors of order root two or pi or something like this. But what I was interested in, it was just sort of an order of magnitude, yeah. Yeah, so bacteria are too small to do a sort of spatial uh, distinction between one side of their body and the other in the way that larger cells are able to do to measure gradients. And so what, what they do instead is they sample over time different parts of their environment as they swim. And so that's the, the model I'm considering here. I'm sort of imagining that the bacterium is taking one measurement here, waiting, you know, pausing for half the time, and then like teleporting over to here and taking the other measurement here for the other half of the time. And then I'm comparing the difference in those measurements to the noise in, the, in each of those measurements. And that, that's ideal, idealized, of course, but that's a pretty good approximation of what you would get if you did this more carefully. Yes? Oh, that's. Or, I mean, because the times would change definitely by yeah. different concentration, different Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea, absolutely no idea. All I know is that what you need to do is measure the run times uh, and then measure the, uh, the properties of the concentration and the gradient in that environment in which you're measuring the run times, which they did. And then, of course, those can change in concert depending on the experiment. Ah, yeah, uh, I do not know enough to answer that question, but I, I, I think it's more the latter, right? So the, I think the run, time of, of run times of E. coli are uh, usually in the or on the order of seconds, right? Um, which means that, that if you take that as a fixture, then that sets the types of environments that they can set and not the other way around. But I, I don't know, actually. Uh, because m most of the uh, experimental knowledge that I have on E. coli comes from Howard Berg, and of course, he, you know, he has he's been studying E. coli for most of his life, et cetera. So, so yeah, no, that's a very good point. Okay, um, so I'll just make a few comments on um, how this type of approach can be extended to. A multicellular problem, right? Because um, I mean, even bacteria. Of course, they're they're single-celled organisms, but um, many bacteria exist in highly coordinated communities, and uh, 
um, <coughs> tissues in in uh, in mammalian organisms, of course, are are tightly packed and and cells communicate with one another at the same time as as needing to sense their environment. So, um, how does this sort of extend to a multicellular context? And I want to continue with you know, paying attention to actual experimental measurements to motivate this question, and maybe that's as far as I'll get, and that's fine. Um, but the, the experimental system with more than one cell that I want to highlight uh, is the embryonic development of the fruit fly, Drosophila, the fruit fly. And this is a, a, a system that, of course, is very well studied, um, but the the bringing to bear these sort of physical constraints um, on the system was first done in detail about 10 years ago in a paper by uh, the group of Bill Bialik, who I think will be here tomorrow, right? So um, this is a paper by his group with Thomas Greger as the first author, I think it was in 2007, and they were looking at uh, the development of the fruit fly, and in particular, they were looking at um, a morphogen gradient of a molecule called bicoid that was being sensed by the cell nuclei, and their determination of the concentration of that molecule would determine whether, you know, they adopted one fate or another fate. So the way this works, so you can imagine a an embryo with many cells in it, and, and there's at, at one end of the embryo, there's deposition of a, of a morphogen molecule, and it forms a, a non uniform profile, an, an exponential decay in this case, of concentration from one end of the embryo to the other. So, this is the concentration of the morphogen bicoid as a function of space. And <coughs> These cell nuclei are um, about uh, 8 microns apart, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And the length scale of this exponential decay of bicoid is about 100 microns. And what happens is there's a particular threshold of this bicoid concentration <coughs> where if a cell nucleus detects more than that amount, then it starts to express a particular gene. And if it detects less than that amount, then it does not express that particular gene. This is vastly simplified, but this is the basic idea okay, for this particular morphogen and readout combination. Now that means that there's a boundary here where cells on this side are, adopt, are you know, going to adopt a particular fade and cells on this side are not. And that means that cells near the boundary need to kind of be good at sensing this bicoid concentration. They need to do it with some sort of precision. And in particular, that precision can be obtained by the ratio of these two link scales if it's an exponential profile. So the relative precision with which cells near the boundary need to sense their local concentration is delta x over lambda, which is about 8 over 100, or we'll just say 10%. Okay, so cells need to have a, you know, a value of this error, this epsilon, of about 10%. Okay? So <coughs> how long do they need to integrate measurements of bicoid in order to achieve this precision? Well, we can just use uh, this rough relationship where the error should be, um, or the square of it should be, 1 over the size of the, of the detector um, times the diffusion coefficient of bicoid times the concentration near this boundary, C0, and then times the amount of time that we need to integrate. Or we can solve this to once again ask about timing here. So the time needs to be greater than um, 1 over A 
d c naught times epsilon squared. OK, so what are the relevant parameters in this system? Well, epsilon is about 10%. The concentration near this boundary is about 5 molecules per micron cubed, or you know, roughly 5 nanomolar. Um, the diffusion coefficient of bicloid in the embryo is a little bit smaller than some small molecule in water, for example, and it's about 1 micron squared per second. And what is the detector? Well, so these are cell nuclei at this point, and so they're, you know, they haven't fully formed their membrane or anything. And bicoid molecules are uh, being detected by, or they're binding to, the promoter region of a particular gene that will be expressed or not to determine the fate of, of the cell. And that promoter region is fairly small. And so it's, it's just a region on the DNA, and it has a, a length scale of about 3 nanomolar. Okay. So once again, if you plug in these numbers to here, you get that the time should be... Yes? How about the size of the detector? Yes. Here is the, 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 the whole size of the promoter. It should it only be just the actual matching of the sequence? Is it like a, a tenth of this number? Ooh, I don't know, actually. Uh, well, because we yeah. Because this is 10 base pair. So yeah, yeah. The, uh, the detector I is one that could be as a match. Yeah, that, that, would be, yeah. that would put an even more stringent limit on how long you would. Uh, you're, you're saying, shouldn't it be smaller, actually? Yeah, In which case, it would. I yeah. You'll see, the problem is that the T I'm going to get is already too big, right? So, you, so if you made the detector smaller, you'd need an even bigger, even bigger time. Although I don't know if, the, you know, maybe molecules can bind to nearby DNA and then slide or something like that. I, don't, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. So <laughs> I'll, I'll put it like this, right? So this will, this will be sort of the minimum amount of time you need to wait if your detector were on the nanometer scale. Um, if you plug these numbers in, you get something like 7,000 seconds. An hour is 3,600 seconds. So this is something like two hours. Now, the problem with this that they notice when they just ran these numbers is that the embryo has only existed for about two hours so far at this point. Okay? And in fact, the cell nuclei have undergone 14 divisions before this point. So they've only existed in their current locations by the 14th cycle for much less than two hours. Right? So it's, it's very likely that the determination by each nuclei of the local concentration of bicoid is occurring in much less than two hours. So how is this possible? Because the physical limit is telling us that you need two hours to get the 10% precision necessary to form a straight boundary, or else you're just going to have a really noisy boundary. Well, the proposal put forward by this group, and then later investigated in more detail by this group, and, and also theoretically, is that cells might be communicating with each other. And the advantage to that is if you're a cell making your own measurements of bicoid, and you encode those measurements in some sort of messenger molecule, then you have stored inside of your cell nucleus the concentration of that messenger molecule. So that's like your own information. But if that molecule is also being passed, shared in a communicating way to nearby neighboring cells, then you're also benefiting from the measurements that other nearby cells have taken of the concentration. And now you get a sort of spatial averaging effect that, we, that is not accounted for by this limit. And that presumably can lower the amount of time needed to get the necessary precision. Now there's a little bit of a trade-off in this particular system because you don't want to average with like every cell in the embryo because then these cells are measuring something really high, these cells are measuring something really low. The actual measurements will, they're supposed to be different over really long length scales. So that actually um, implies a, an optimal sharing distance, an optimal amount of communication
from cell to cell. And some of the candidate messenger molecules, um, their diffusion coefficients are known, and they're, they're pretty much within this regime of optimal diffusion coefficients. So that offers at least some anecdotal evidence for some sort of spatial averaging um, that's helping these cells measure. And I'll just mention, then, um, one of the main projects that got me into looking at the precision of cellular sensing, in particular in multicellular systems, was um, a similar problem of uh, detecting a, a spatial gradient in concentration. But this was with epithelial cells. So during my last year as a postdoc, I was in a group that was collaborating with some experimentalists looking at epithelial cells that they had taken out of mice. And these epithelial cells are very good at sensing gradients of epidermal growth factor. They can sense um, about uh, 50 nanomolars per millimeter gradients of epidermal growth factor individually. You can see an, an individual epithelial cell sort of swim uh, toward higher concentrations. If you lower that gradient by 100 fold, they just swim randomly. Okay, that's just too much. They can't detect it. But in their natural state, these epithelial cells are forming ducts. So they're like, you know, very, uh, like, like a, a very highly organized tissue. If you keep groups of about 100 or so epithelial cells in their tissue-like state and expose them to the gradients that are 100 times shallower, then they'll do this weird thing where they sort of form multicellular protrusions, so the, sort of these branches. And they'll form more branches on the high side of the concentration than on the low side of the concentration, even though no individual member of that group can detect that really, really shallow concentration. As a unit, they can detect it. And then just to prove to ourselves that that was uh, happening because of the exchange of some communication, we could add a drug and that blocked the gap junctions between these epithelial cells. They still form these branches but the branches were now isotropic. They were completely unbiased by the gradient. So, you know, then we went to town with Bergen Purcell and sort of derived some of these multicellular limits. But the point is that that, I think, was a really beautiful experiment done by our collaborators because it showed that if you remove the ability for cells to communicate, then they, they lose this collective sensing capacity. And so it, it's, it's, it's not just about sort of being a larger sensory unit because you're 100 cells and not one, but rather it's the exchange of information among all the constituent cells that allows cells to sort of surpass this single bird per cell limit and do something much more sensitive together. Okay, so I think that's my time and I'll stop there. <laughs>